This program does not provide medical advice. We assume no liability for the information provided on MindForce Radio. Please consult your physician before beginning any exercise or nutrition program. This is Roger LaPointe, and I have known Bob Whalen for many years at this point, and he is one of the most intense individuals you will ever meet. Go Mind Force Radio. From Mind Force Radio, this is Natural Strength Night with Maximum Bob. On Natural Strength Night, we don't talk about the other things Bob likes to talk about. Tonight, we only talk strength training. When I say strength training, I don't mean training like punk-ass goons in the muscle magazines who jacked up on juice, steroids, and PEDs. I mean natural strength. Strength built on good food, heavy weights, and no shortcuts. If you want to learn about real natural strength, weight training the right way, the old school way, stick around. Bob and his friends just might teach you something. He's here, the host of Natural Strength Night, Maximum Bob Whalen. Tonight, our guest is one of the top muscle writers of our time, Dave Yarnell. Dave is a true dyed-in-the-wool iron game expert and historian. He has spent 43 years in the lifting trenches. He started weight training at age 12, and since then, he has read almost every book and magazine related to the subject. He has also competed in powerlifting for close to 30 years and has some impressive lifts. He has written for Powerlifting USA, NaturalStrength.com, and others. But it's his books that really make Dave shine. Dave has written 14 great Iron Game books, and just to name a few, his titles include King Squat, Rise to Power, Forgotten Secrets of the Old Time Strongmen, Getting in the Zone, the Mental Aspects of Strength Training Revealed, The Old School Strength Training Secrets Bible, The Illustrated Old School Muscle Building Secrets Manual, and several others that I'll be mentioning in my questions. Dave is a well-rounded guy and has other passions too, including conservative politics and fishing. He is a writer for a fishing magazine. David is also a devout Christian. He has a great website called ChristianIron.com. Dave, it's great to have you on the show, and welcome to Natural Strength Night. Well, thanks, Bob, and it's uh, it's great to be with you, and I hope we can have an awesome conversation. I'm sure we will. And Dave, before we get started with the training questions, please give us an update on ChristianIron.com. I know it was down for a while and you were updating the site. Is it up yet? And, uh, you know, what is the best way for people to find you online? Uh, All you have to do, it is up. It is running. It's been up for a while. Um, All you have to do is type in, you know, go to Google and type in Christian Iron and it'll come up. I haven't updated a lot of stuff lately just because of uh, access issues, but... um, there's still a lot of good stuff on there. There's links. I have a whole lot of videos, training videos. Uh, one of my uh, things that I like to do is, is build my own equipment. Um, and, you know, look, I have links to other people that build their own equipment. That's called uh, Frugal Fitness. So um, I've, I've tinkered around with a lot of different things. And um, I, I used to go to forums and look at what people build. So I have I have links to various things like that. Um, then there's obviously links to Christian things. Um, and you know, the theme is basically, you know, like you say, mind, body, and spirit. I, you know, I've always, you know, I've been interested in, in lifting for, as you said, you know, I started lifting when I was 12. Um, and I've been a Christian since I was like eight, uh, you know, going to church my whole life. I haven't always been the best Christian, and, um, you know, I went kind of astray when I was a teenager for a while, up until my late 20s or so, but um, I, so I wanted to emphasize my faith, 
um, try to get people interested and have stuff available if people are are searching um, or not. But you know, without trying to like beat people over the head with it, I don't. I don't. You know, I don't want to have too harsh of an approach. I like to put stuff out there. If you're interested in it, it's there. Great. Um, and if you have other religion, other faith, I'm not going to put you down. Um, you're welcome, and we can have conversations about it. Okay, and Dave, give us some uh, information about your equipment that you build. I've built um, the attachments to I, – I have a power rack, of course. So one of the you, things you built was – um, I didn't build the power rack, no. It's a, it's a you know, something I got um, – I think off Craigslist or something, <laughs> but, you know, again, I'm frugal. So, um, I, I made a, a lever attachment. Um, mm-hmm. and it was actually like, I took apart, like I had stuff. I, I, another thing my wife loves about me is I, I never throw anything out. I, I have old benches and pieces of benches and stuff laying around. But basically I, I took, um, a rectangular, uh, base of a bench and if you fit that over one of the bars in the uh, in the power rack on the side there, um, then you can put two like the old standard barbells in the in the square tubing on either side, and and now that hmm. becomes a lever device. So you can put that at any any level of the power rack. You can use it to do squats. You can use it to do um, shrugs. Uh, uh, you can use it to, uh, for Viking press, any number of things like that. Um, oh, that's great. That's, that's one of my favorite things I did, yeah. Do you still um, sell equipment that you build? I've never sold any equipment um, at all. Um, not really my thing. <laughs> Books is the only thing I really sell. Now, if, if any of our listeners wanted to start a good, you know, hardcore home gym, what would be the basics that you'd, you'd recommend they start with? Well, like you said, um, a power cage, especially if you're a power lifter. But really, if you did kind of do any hardcore strength training, and especially if you're going to be training by yourself, a power cage is almost a must because, you know, you can train safely or 90% safely by yourself when you have to. And, frankly, I used to train by myself quite a bit. So, you know, when I when I outfitted my home gym, that was the first thing I was going to look for and of course you need you know a couple of decent olympic bars well you really need one but um at least at least one good olympic bar um olympic plates um and i have old standard barbells and stuff too i'm a bit of a collector and you know i'm always looking for old plates just because they're cool you know Uh, Mm -hmm. i don't have anything of tremendous value i have you know like a one pair of the deep dish but they're not even a name brand. And I'm seeing, like, York, the old York deep dish plates are going for big yep. bucks these days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're rare to see now. Remember, they used to be so easy to hold on to because you had that big lip on them. Yeah. Zuber's plates are another thing that's big money, but obviously there's not a whole lot of those around. No. Um, Richard Starr and Richard Sarin has quite a collection of, of the Zuber plates and all kinds of other stuff. I don't know if you know Richard Sarin. Oh, yeah, I know him real good. Yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah. I, I've talked to him since the 90s. Soren X, yeah, they make in... good hardcore equipment. And, Dave, what are some of the common training mistakes that you see beginners make? Uh, that's a good one. <laughs> well, I do train at a commercial gym quite a bit because it's close and just convenient. And a lot of the kids, uh, one of the biggest things is um, cheating and doing force reps. Now, and I've talked about this before with force reps, but like, and talked about it in my book about the Culver City guys. What they, what their force reps was, was um, barely touching the bar. Um, it, it was almost more psychological than it was anything physical. And it, you know, it's like when you get to the point where you can't pop, you, you do a strict set, and when you get to the point where you cannot complete a rep by yourself in good form. Then, then the lifter just puts his fingers under the bar or visibly behind you, you know, lend some assistance if you're squatting. You know, mm-hmm. you may have a guy on either side. But it, it's just enough so that you can complete the rep. I see guys in the gym, and they have, like, on the bench press, it's typical. They'll put on 50 pounds or more than they can really do, 
and then they had right. their partner over top of them, um, basically doing bent over rows. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, I know. <laughs> it, it's it's not doing the lift or any good at all, you know. And it's like, oh yeah, I just did X amount of weight. Well, not really, you know. Right. Or they'll they'll bench press with their butt off the bench and heaving and which you know. And I'm not against cheat reps per se here and there, but it shouldn't right. be something you do all the time. Right. Yeah, a lot of guys, their form is so terrible, it's a joke. But you see it all the time. It's almost like a normal thing to see when you go in a commercial gym. Yeah. And there's other guys that, uh, you know, obviously all the commercial gyms have different machines. And, you know, obviously old school people are kind of anti-machine. I'm not dead set against using machines. I think some machines can be valuable, especially if you're recouping from an injury um, or have mobility issues, have arthritis like myself. There's some machines that, that you know, can really help you out. But, you know, you don't want to use machines exclusively. I like to think of them as a nice adjunct to barbell and dumbbell training. Right. I used only free wedge till I was around 40, and then I was introduced to machines mainly by being friends with Drew Israel. And uh, I kind of turned my I, – I kind of changed my opinion on machines – most machines I don't like, but there are some good ones, like a lot of the hammer strength and, you know, so, some of the, there are some good hardcore machines, but uh, but overall I like the barbells and dumbbells better. Yeah, and a lot of the, the like you said, the hammer strengths have the plate-loaded machines, which are pretty good too, you know. Um, There's a new one now called the Pitch Shark, which is pretty awesome too. You have to see it to believe it. Sounds interesting, yeah. What do you Look think of up. some of the guys that are specializing too early? There's a lot of beginners out there who are just starting out, and they're you know they haven't really paid their dues with the bar bill yet. I mean, I I think you should lift, you know, get your lifts up to a reasonable level before you start specializing. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm with you there. I uh, and I understand that mindset. And yeah, there are a lot of people out there. There's a lot of guys now who don't lift at all. They'd be a lot better off, I think, spending some time with the barbell before they start specializing in grip and bending, you know, get, get your lifts up first and then spend, spend three to five years lifting heavy before you do that. If you want to maximize your, your strength potential, if that's what you want to do, please describe the, uh, the basics of your own training philosophy. Um, obviously I'm drug free. I have been, I, I think I've shared with you that I have used in the past, but I, I haven't done anything since, 91 was the last cycle I ever did. Um, I'm not, you know, proud or bragging about that I did it, but I'm not going to lie to people. I did it. Um, you know, I went to a powerlifting gym at the time where it was very commonplace. And right. even before I was a powerlifter, I saw all these people, like, gaining tremendous strength very quickly. And I was, you know, and I'm working my butt off making a much slower game. <laughs> You know, and then and back then it was um, it was a couple guys that routinely had stuff, and it, it was a misdemeanor back then. I think uh, you know with steroids. I think actually in '91 is where it, it became in the same classification as like hard drugs, which was right. one of the many factors that made me say, "All right, I'm done with this whole thing." <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, I, I made gains. I got stronger. Um, but I I saw some of my friends that had serious anger management issues, and you know the whole roid rage thing. I saw that personally myself. Uh, I'm a pretty laid back guy, so I don't think that I. I mean, yeah, I probably got a little you know angrier than I would have had I never done anything. But I, nothing never really got out of hand. But and then I saw right. a lot of health problems, especially with older guys. I saw right. guys that, that had heart issues and and then tearing muscles very frequently um, because you know there's like imbalances that steroids create when you're when you especially when you overdo them take them all the time and that, and that's another problem they they develop a psychological dependency and and that's right. where a lot of guys you know really get into trouble you know and it the idea is always. Uh, you know, if this much gives me this much gains, well, if I take 10 times this much, I'm going to be Superman. Well, right. not so much. You're going to kill yourself. You know? 
I commend you for for stopping taking it. Well, um, you know, I did it for my own benefit, and and of course, I, and I got then I, I got involved more recently with uh, the Twin City Barbell Club, and one of the founders uh, there's a guy named Nick Theodoro, who was actually one of the founding members of um, the the early drug free powerlifting uh, foundation with Brother Bennett and um, Al Siegel and and some other guys. But uh, very adamantly anti-drug because, you know, again, he's been – they were Olympic lifters way back. I mean, he's – Nick is like 63, 64. Uh, The guy was just recently um, retired from competitive powerlifting. But even at age 60, at a weight of like 165 pounds, he was pulling like 600 pounds. Or at least well into the fives, yeah. And the guys never touched the drug. Um, now there are there are some guys that were in our club that actually uh, lifted with York Barbell, and um, they were taking stuff, and they didn't even know they were taking stuff because you know when Dr. Ziegler invented D ball, and a lot of those York guys were oh, here, take this vitamin, it's going to work really good, and they didn't even know what they were taking. Eventually, <laughs> yep. you know, they figured it out. Um, but you know, back then it wasn't it wasn't illegal. People didn't know what the dangers were, and it was you know let's beat the Russians. The Russians, I think, beat us to the punch on the whole steroid thing, and and people saw them making tremendous gains, and they thought, wow, this is this is the way to beat them. Well, you know, and we kind yeah, of the Russians came box out there. of the woodwork. Yeah, the the Russians be, before World War Two, the Russians weren't good at all. And after World War II, they, they come in and they start kicking butt and uh, we're wondering what's going on. You know, the 1952 Olympics in Helsinki, that's what that's what opened everyone's eyes. And it took us seven or eight years to catch up with them on the drugs, you know, before we finally figured it out. But they got it from the German scientists. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Russian kettlebell training is another thing that, you know, has been popularized. But um, they were, I think, more scientific before we were about their training and um, using percentages and kind of going a little bit further than the old old school um, direct, you know, linearization um, and training with doing um, speed work and that kind of thing, um, using, as Fred Hatfield would say, compensatory acceleration doing like lots of single reps with their Olympic training. And then gradually that went into powerlifting as well. Yeah. When you power lifted, how many days a week did you squat once or twice? Uh, squat was always once. And deadlifts once a week or once every two weeks? Uh, usually I, I kind of alternated between heavy squats and have, and, um, and heavy dead, heavy deadlifts were, um, only every other week, typically. You know, sometimes starting out a cycle, I would go every week when I'm still like in the light, high rep phase. But as the weights got heavier, I would have to, you know, back off to like every other week. And then yeah. on that alternate week, I would still do something, some form of a deadlift. Um, but, um, you know, it might be stiff legs. Um, now I'm a conventional puller, so I'm, I might do. Um, the wide stance or the sumo stance or do sumo stance with a fat bar or something, some kind of variation like that with a lighter weight or speed work, something with bands, chains on that alternate week. Squatting, you know, on the, I would do my heavier squats on that week when I was deadlifting light so that I Mm. wasn't, wasn't, you know, going balls to the wall on squats and deadlifts on the same day, typically. Right. How many days a week did you bench press? Bench press, um, a lot of, there was a lot of years where I was kind of a bench press specialist. Like I went to a lot of bench meets and um, I kind of concentrated that more on that than my, I didn't even really become, um, I did my, I did a, a couple of full meets back in the eighties. And then afterwards when I got, when I got off the steroids and everything, that's when I kind of started specializing in the bench. I still always deadlifted and squatted. It just wasn't Mm -hmm. my biggest emphasis. But when I was concentrating on the bench, I would do two days a week, but it would be a heavy day and a light day. What are some of your favorite 
assistance exercises to, to build up your bench press? Um, I've always liked head knockers. I mean, you got to do triceps. And it, that's another thing that you see, you know, a lot of the younger crowd or um, rookies doing is biceps, biceps, biceps. Everybody wants big arms and they train their biceps. Well, your triceps are twice the size, pretty much, of your biceps. Right. So True. you should be training your triceps at least as much, if not more, than your biceps if you want to have, obviously, strength and a big arm. Um, but, I, yeah, I like uh, I like head knockers, um, <laughs> pullovers. I like uh, put the rope uh, pushdowns. Um, I've been doing some, like, overhead rope pushdowns where you're kind of leaning away from the cable machine. Right. Um, that's a little, that hits your lats a little bit, which there's nothing wrong with that. Um, close grip bench press. I can't do them as much lately because of the shoulder issues. I used to love yep. doing heavy close grips. Um, what about and, dips? And, you know, floor, floor presses. Dips, yeah. Um, I'm, I don't do a lot of dips. I do them. I have done them occasionally. Um, again, lately, that's a little rough on the shoulder, so. Um, right. I do the ones, you know, where you're, uh, where you have your hands on a bench behind you, like uh, bench dips, or what do you uh, call those? Um, when you're competing in powerlifting, do you incorporate some of the other basic lifts, like military press, into your routine, or just, you know, mainly for pushing, stick to just bench press? I have on and off done shoulder work, but mostly on. And I, I've, I've found that if I don't do, if I um, the shoulder work and try to concentrate more just on like chest. It, it just doesn't work, um, and it's weird because you know the more my shoulders bothered me, especially in recent years, and I would mm-hmm. you know, try to get away from shoulder work, the worse my shoulders would get. And, and right. it's a funny thing because I actually was in a phase where I was doing shoulder work before bench press, which you know in a bodybuilding world, which I'm not, but. Even and in powerlifting too, they always, well you want to do your your heaviest stuff first, and then you do your systems later. And I get that mentality, but I found that if I trained my shoulders and didn't go super heavy, and got my shoulders really warm before I bench pressed, the bench press mm-hmm. went better. You know, right. so and, and not doing shoulders at all is it's not going to help your bench press. You have to do some shoulder work really. I think sequence is something that you should uh, experiment with. I would go against the grain and make my own sequence. Yeah, and, and that, you can say that about any exercise. But, and I like um, variations on the bigger exercises, too. Um, you know, right. some people are locked into one thing, like always doing standing overhead barbell press. Well, you know, mm-hmm. try some dumbbells. Try some kettlebells. Try one arm at a time. Um, right. Use a machine here and there. You know, it's not going to kill you. They actually have a pretty decent machine at the gym I go to where you're where you're sitting and the weight is kind of on an angle behind you. Um, and it, you know, you don't. It isolates the shoulders pretty well the way it, the way it has you situated because you can't really right. use your legs. Um, doesn't bother your back. Uh, that's another thing that you know doing uh, like standing overhead barbell press. If you start getting heavy and you tend to cheat a little bit, you start bending your back backwards and, you know, things can get ugly. Uh, that's that's <laughs> right. one thing That's one thing I'm not real big on. I can't say anything against it. There's people that love it. It's a great exercise. It's just right. not my favorite. Um, I, I like doing um, slightly a high incline bench where I'm not sitting – dead upright but just lean back a little bit it's almost like a, a super high incline bench you know yeah the machines are really good if you're training people that's probably the main reason i started getting machines especially when you have older people who have problems you know you don't have to worry so much about them if you have a uh, a guy in his 50s and he's pretty new at lifting uh, i feel a lot safer putting him in a machine than trying to teach him how to do a uh, an incline press with the bar so, yeah, yeah, for the training and, business, I think they're great. Yeah, and, it, and it's good for, like, if you have um, – a lot of people have anomalies where, you know, one side's a little bigger, a little stronger than the other. And you it, it, you might end up bench pressing a little bit crooked 
And I've done it myself and not realized it until people are handing the bar off to me. And I'm like, why are they handing it off crooked? <laughs> and after, yeah. you know, 10 different people handed the bar off to me crooked, I realized it's not them, it's me. <laughs> Everybody has cell phones and we can take videos of each other. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people just want to take selfies, you know, and some of these forums are all just, you know, guys, what do you think? You know, stop with that already. We'll be back with more right after this. This segment brought to you by VitalNutritionStore.com. Did you know that more than 7 million Americans suffer from coronary heart disease, the most common form of heart disease? Regardless of your age or condition, adding Cardio for Life to your daily regime will dramatically improve your cardiovascular condition. Cardio for Life has been the top-selling Enlarger 9 product in the marketplace now for more than three years. It is also the top-selling product at VitalNutritionStore.com. Formulated by Dr. Harry Elwart, the best-selling author of Let's Stop the Number One Killer of Americans Today, Dr. Harry believes together we can prevent and reverse heart disease. Cardio for Life comes in three wonderful flavors, orange, peach, and grape, and is gluten-free, sugar-free, and sodium-free. Please see our complete line of natural products at vitalnutritionstore.com. That's V-I-T-A-L nutritionstore.com. Randy Roach shocked the world with the release of his first volume of Muscle Smoke and Mirrors several years ago. It was a masterpiece of over 500 pages with such in-depth research and detail that it was not only surprising, but shocking and mind-blowing. It was truly one of the best Iron Game history books ever written. He followed that with Volume 2, another epic book with over 700 pages of equal depth and detail. All serious Iron Game fans need to have these books. Please visit Randy's website at randyroach.ca. That's R-A-N-D-Y-R-O-A-C-H dot C-A. Listen to how Iron Game legend and the Iron Master editor, Osmo Kihaw, describes the book Supernatural Strength. Have you ever wondered how much real-world experience authors have when they write books about weight training? Who is that person behind the computer? What do they really know about the Iron Game? If you picked up this book, Supernatural Strength, you have definitely come to the right place. The author, Bob Whalen, has spent several decades in the Iron Game trenches training himself, competing and coaching in powerlifting, earning academic credentials too numerous to mention, and thousands of hours of training and instructing athletes and trainees of all levels at his Washington, D.C. gym since 1990. He's not only devoted his life to motivating and pushing people to heights they have never been to, but elevating the trainees' understanding why certain methods work better than others. Bob is one of the most respected and revered trainers in the business today. This book is sure to surprise and amaze you at the same time. Order now at SupernaturalStrength.com. That's SupernaturalStrength.com. Don't you think it would be so much easier getting into shape if you had a personal coach? Just like all the celebrities do. Well, now you can. Bob Whalen of WebStrengthCoach.com wants to get you out of your rut and coach you to success. He's dedicated to helping you achieve your strength and fitness goals through your hard work and his expert guidance. Bob will help you with strength training, muscle building, fitness, nutrition, and motivation. He'll make sure you achieve your maximum physical potential. You can get one-on-one training with Bob through his website webstrengthcoach.com he will develop a personalized program tailored to your individual needs a program right for you bob will give you feedback after every workout this is old school fitness and nutrition no fads and no gimmicks bob will use proven natural techniques to make sure you are satisfied so visit webstrengthcoach.com today and let bob help you reach your best self webstrengthcoach.com Do you enjoy history without social engineering? Reading about our founding fathers? Economics from a capitalist perspective? Wisdom from modern patriots? Welcome to UncleSamBooks.com, where virtues like rugged individualism, hard work, and the American dream dominate. UncleSamBooks.com. Great books for homeschooling. UncleSamBooks.com. If you want to become as strong and muscular as possible with health in mind and without lowering yourself to using steroids, the best advice can be found in the classic strongman books of long ago. 
These are the best books ever written on the subjects of strength training, weightlifting, strongman training, iron game history, and old-time physical culture. Many of them can still be found at physicalculturebooks.com. There you will find good, honest, time-tested wisdom from the great old-time strongmen to maximize your natural muscular and strength potential. Please visit physicalculturebooks.com. Listen to Ken Manny, head strength and conditioning coach at Michigan State University, describe the book Iron Nation. A masterpiece text on some of the most intriguing and compelling personal stories, Iron Game history, and gut-wrenching training routines ever put to paper. If you truly love hard training without all the frills of pomp and circumstance so common today, you will love Iron Nation. Written by lifters for lifters. If you love weight training, you will love Iron Nation. Order now at ironnation.com. That's I-R-O-N nation.com. If you would like to promote your business on MindForce Radio, we would love to hear from you. Please let us know if you are interested in a 30 or 60 second voice commercial or a banner website ad. Please contact Bob using the contact information provided on MindForceRadio.com. You're listening to Natural Strength Night on MindForce Radio. Taking videos is a valuable tool because, you know, you can you can look at, like, take a side shot of you squatting. You know, you may think you're squatting to depth, and then you get a, a video, and mm, not so much. I'm a little high, you know. <laughs> um, yep. And it can save a lot of arguments with your training partners when you can see it right there in front of you. Oh, yeah, I was a little off there, you know. Describe some of the forgotten of secrets the forgotten of the old-time secrets, strongmen the old-time that are in your book. Well, a lot of the old time secrets are really not so secret in that it's it's about hard work. It's about hard, consistent training. Um, you know, and it's it's almost an oxymoronic uh saying sometimes because, you know, the secret is there is no secret. It's it's that you have to work hard. That there there is no like, you know, the five minute abs thing. If you think you can get abs in five minutes, well, you know, there's a sucker born every minute and that's why so many of these gadgets and gizmos out there, you know, will tell right. you, oh, you only, all you have to do is train 15 minutes a day with this thing, and it's going to make you super strong. Well, there's no <laughs> such thing. You know, you have to put in right. hard, consistent training. Um, you know, it doesn't have to absolutely be with barbells, but that's the traditional, really the best way of doing it. And, you know, it was frowned upon back in the old days, you know, like Paul Anderson played football early on when he was a kid and you know when he, he was lifting weights and and like the coaches tell him no you, you know you're going to get muscle bound and that was like a, a common term back in those days oh you don't want to well, lift that, weights you're going to get muscle bound that was common well, in my what? day back in those days they just they did everything the hard way you know and like um if you i don't know if you know who james fuller is or the the usawa they do the old school lifts uh, you know, right. that, and it comes from the, the British Weightlifting Association, where they had, they didn't just have three lifts, like three Olympic lifts or three power lifts. They had a whole host of lifts, and they were from right. every possible angle. And, and a lot of those lifts, you know, you'll post them, like I'll post them on my Forgotten Strength Secrets page, and people are like, oh, why would you want to do that? Oh, you're going to hurt yourself. Oh, you know, that's that's the old school. That's, it's not supposed to be easy. And... Anything worthwhile, there's going to be some risk involved. Obviously, if you aspire to squat a thousand pounds, you're not going to get there without taking a little bit of risk here and there, you know. Or you know, <laughs> strongman feats or anything like that. If you want to accomplish anything great, you know, you have to. You have to. Uh, you can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs. And, and, and right. you know, back then. You didn't have you didn't even have squat racks back then. You had uh, like Milo Steinborn, 
with the Steinborn lift. He would, you know, put the barbell on one side and, and you know, work it up on the shoulders and then squat with it. You know, and, mm-hmm. it, it, and people look at that and think it's crazy. Or, or you had the guys that would do, um, like, a leg press with a with a barbell, you know, and they'd just have it kind of rest in between the heel of their shoe and, and the sole of their shoe. <laughs> and it's like, right, really? Right, they risk their life to do leg presses. Yeah, and, you know, um, and a lot, there wasn't, they didn't have benches. A lot of stuff was floor-based. Uh, and you know, I've known some guys when I was a kid. There was a guy in the neighborhood that just had a just had a barbell set, and um, I mean, he didn't even have a bench. And he was <laughs> strong as hell. And all he ever did was, you know, pick up that barbell and do like, you know, he'd clean clean a press, clean and jerk, um, deadlifts, you know, and he would pick up clean and press and put it on his back and do squats. <laughs> and right, strong guy, you know. That's how it was done back in those days. Right, and there wasn't a lot of good information out there either. It's like these guys were just hungry for anything they could find, and there wasn't hardly any good gyms around then either. No. Tommy oh, no. Kono, he used to hitchhike he'd hitchhike over 100 miles just to use an Olympic bar. <laughs> Equipment was hard to come by. There wasn't very many good gyms. Almost everybody was against you. Most coaches were against it. Besides their determination and toughness, they had to be mentally tough to ignore all the the bad advice and people discouraging them and having lack of equipment. I mean, these guys were mentally tough, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's that's another factor, I think. Um, and, you know, like my one book that's uh, largely based on my club, um, I talked about local guys here in Pennsylvania. It's not just a Pennsylvania thing, but um, it's more what I know. You have guys working in coal mines and steel mills and shipyards and then coming home and lifting weights. And, right. you know, that's like mind-boggling. And today it's like, you know, people come home from the office where they've been sitting on their butt all day and, and they're too too tired or too lazy to go to the gym because <laughs> they work all day. Give me a break, you know? know. Yep. You're from the the coal mining area of uh, Pennsylvania, right? I have family from that area. I, I'm in Quakertown, so we're a little we're a little below that area, but we're not far from it. And we did have um, Allentown right up the road. You know, big steel mill. You had Bethlehem Steel. You had uh, Fairless Hill Steel. So a lot of steel works and stuff like that too. And that's another place that's uh, you know you got to be a pretty tough guy to work in a steel mill. What advice do you give to your clients to get them in the zone mentally for training? I know you wrote a, a really good book about the, the mental aspects of training. So tell us about that. Well, I, you know, I, I've studied a little bit about self-hypnosis. And I think, um, I think anybody that has trained for a long time is kind of practicing self-hypnosis, whether they even realize it or not. Um, you're doing um, self-talk. You want to you want to get yourself in a positive frame of mind, and it, it's really about um, extreme focus. So you kind of you know, that's one good thing about like going to a, a commercial gym. You, you can get into socializing, and not that I'm against socializing, talking to people. I'm not one of those guys that's like don't talk to me, or you know, especially if I'm getting ready to do a set. But when when you're getting ready to do that set, especially if you're going to do something heavy, you have to have all the minutia of day to day stuff out of your mind. You have to be completely focused on you versus that weight. Because if you're thinking about anything other than that, you're you're going to get hurt and or you're not going to make the weight. So it, to me, it's about it's like a, a laser like focus. Um, and it's something that you need to work on and, and constantly um, be practicing. And um, sometimes when you're even out of the gym, visualization is a big thing. And a, a number of people have talked about um, doing visual, visualization, especially um, coming up to contest time. Um, right. You you know, kind of just envision yourself doing every step from, you know, putting on gear if you're wearing gear um, you know, whether it's wrist wraps or knee wraps or a suit for those people to do that kind of thing, um, putting chalk on your hands, um, every little step of you, you just going through mentally exactly what you're going to do on the stage. So then when you get out there, it's just, it's just a matter of following through. You've done this, you know, a thousand times in your head. In my case, right. it's probably 
you know, in reality, I've done it a thousand times. And it's, it's funny because you still get you still get nervous, you know, even when you're when you get ready to go out there. And it's almost I'd like to say it, uh, if you don't get nervous, it's kind of like you're missing something. Adrenaline is a good thing, you know. So that being nervous creates that adrenaline, which in turn can make you lift really big. Now, it can also make you screw up. And, and you know, I have. I think a lot of us have. But you learn from your mistakes. And, you know, the other thing is to have a short memory about those mistakes. Don't dwell on, I just messed up. I missed my lift. I, I, did a, I missed a stupid I lift on a stupid technicality. You know what? You forget that. You go back out there and you make your next attempt. Um, and, and that kind of, you know, sometimes takes more um, mental focus than anything. Sometimes you have a client who likes to talk in between sets when they're resting. Then you got to get them to stop talking. The key thing is to, before you start the lift, I have them take about 20 seconds and focus on what they're doing before they lift. You're not just going to go from talking and then right into lifting. I have them take 20 seconds and get their mind into a, a hostile mode, concentrate on what they're going to do before they start the lift. That, that's a good way of putting it, hostile. <laughs> I get angry. Like, and you know, I was getting ready to, you know, even do a, um, a high rep set. I would try to kind of work myself into a frenzy. Now, <laughs> you don't do you too. don't want to walk, you don't want to go through an entire meet, uh, and you couldn't possibly in that frame of mind. So you kind of have right. to be able to switch it on and off, which is Agreed. you know sometimes easier said than done. You have to be able to um, to focus that aggression, that intensity, just right at the right moment, because if you you're just going to burn yourself out. And sometimes you can even, when you, on your way to the gym or something, you, you're, you get yourself so jacked up about, I'm going to do X, Y, Z. I have to do X number of reps and sets. You get yourself halfway burnt out before you ever get to the gym. You know, you need, you need to That's relax right. and, you know, think about what you're going to do. Uh, and the other thing is don't put too much pressure on yourself. You know, you got to have fun with it. As soon as you start to say, I have to do X number of reps of X number of weight today, you develop a, a bad mentality towards it. You know, you, you go in and you do the best you can. You're going to have a bad day here and there. We all get sick. Right. You know, you have you have days where your energy isn't as good. Well, you can kind of sense that going in. Um, you know, it, and it's a fine line because sometimes you, get, you you can get lazy and, and you talk yourself out of things because you, you feel a little off, and you don't want to you don't want to get to the point where anytime everything's not a hundred percent, you just say, eh, it's going to be one of those days." You don't want to take it to that right. level. But you, you know, if you're sick as a dog and it's just not happening today, don't try for a PR. You know, go in and do what you can do, and and you know, live to fight another day. I agree. And I think sometimes it's good to be your own coach. If you're competing in powerlifting and you fail during your workout, like suppose you want to get a double with a certain weight or a triple with a certain weight, and then you don't get it two or three times in a row, I, I usually don't want to fail more than two times in a row. I'll change the goal. When you change the goal, you'll say, instead of trying a certain weight for two, I'll, I'll try something for uh, three or four with a slightly lighter weight, or I might even go heavier and try to get a single, but I'll, I'll change the goal to take the pressure off my mind. I remember one time I was stuck at a certain weight for a long time. I couldn't get to a certain weight of one rep max on the bench press, and I was stuck there for a long time. Well, finally, I, just, I put five more pounds on the bar, and I did it. So it's just I did five more I did five more pounds, but just because it was a different goal, and I I told myself in my head that there's no pressure. I'm probably not going to get this because it's five pounds more. I'm just going to do my best and try it anyways. And just by taking the pressure off myself, I got it. There are certain oh, round right. numbers that are just like a you know this monumental thing that we can overcome. Like I remember for years it was the 300 pound bench press. You know, and it's like, oh, man, if I could only ever bench press 300, you know, you could do 275 for reps, but 300 <laughs> was like that magic number. 
And then, and then once you got past the 300, all of a sudden, now you're doing 315 and 320, and it's like, why did I think 300 was so hard, you know? That, that's exactly what it was for me, because I think that's what it was. I think when I was like 19 or 20 or something, I was in the Air Force, and I remember I was stuck at like 295 forever, and every time I tried 300, I get crushed. And then one day I threw on 305 and said, to hell with it, let's just see what happens, and I got it. <laughs> so yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Those yeah, round numbers you know, really play games with you. Yep. And, you know, there's a number of tricks you can play on yourself and, and with your training partners. Like, you know, a lot of times you'll have, um, I've seen where training partners will put on a weight and the guy doesn't know even know what he's lift, you know, and they'll even lie to him. You know, it's X amount of weight, something that they've done all the time. And they think, yeah, I've done this, you know, a hundred times before. Uh, meanwhile, it's a PR, and they, they do it because they think they've done it a hundred times. I do that to my clients all the time. And when, when someone appears nervous about something or he's going for a you know a special lift. Yeah, well, sometimes they'll get angry with you, but usually it's the other way around. They're very happy. It's like, you know, everybody's happy to get a PR, obviously. Yeah, Dave, we have time for one more. You wrote a great book called Secrets of Age-Defying Strength and How to Obtain It. Um, please give us some good tips from that book. It's consistent hard work. There's not any not any shortcuts. There's not any five-minute abs or any of that kind of stuff. You have to train hard, train consistently. Um, and obviously, as you age, there's a, a number of things that you have to keep in mind. Nutrition is one of them. When you're younger, we've all seen, and you know, like my teenage stepsons and now in their 20s, they're, they all, and they all work out, but they eat like horses and they can eat anything they want and they still have six packs. It's like, how do you do that? Well, obviously the older, the older you get and you know, your testosterone and growth hormone levels aren't what they used to be. It's not going to stay the same. So you have to be more careful about what you're eating. And um, really, you know, even if you can get away with that, it's not a good idea because your your body is going to respond better. You're going to build muscle. You're going to stay healthy if you eat quality food. You have to eat the right amount of food. You have to eat good quality food. Um, and some of this stuff today, like people are down on cholesterol. Well, guess what? Your body needs cholesterol to make testosterone. That's right. There was phases like, and, you know, Pinsteranda was one on eating massive amounts of raw eggs. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of old-time lifters and bodybuilders ate eggs all the time. Were they worried about their cholesterol? Not so much. Now, if you're sedentary and sitting around on the couch and you have an office job and you don't work out, yeah, it's something you need to be concerned with. But if you're hard training, especially if you're in the gym like every day and you're, and you're working to be you know, a world-class power lifter, a strongman, a bodybuilder, you need lots of protein, you need some cholesterol, you need some good quality fat. Red meat is good. You know, maybe you don't want to eat red meat three times a day, but you need some red meat, I think. Um, it's a good source of protein. And you need, you know, you can't live on um, on chips and pretzels and stuff like that either. Um, a lot of people overemphasize junk. You can't eat uh, pastries. And I'm not saying you can't eat it, but it's not something you should be you shouldn't be having pastry for breakfast or, you know, a bagel and cream cheese for breakfast. Maybe on top of your eggs and bacon if you're really trying to bulk up. Uh, <laughs> that's one of the areas. And then another area is, is flexibility. And I have to admit, it's not something that I keyed on as much as I should have when I was younger. And it's kind of one of those things that a lot of us don't start really get interested in until... Not that it's too late, but it, you would have been much better off had you been doing it through your whole career. Um, and a lot of uh, today, you got people with the um, using foam rollers and the self myofascial release, which is a good thing. Uh, like a lot of the younger guys in my club now, they don't even start you know hitting the barbells and stuff until they've done a nice. 15, 20 minute warm up session and the foam roller and the whole nine. And it's really not a bad idea to do that kind of thing. And, and I, you know, I think in the past, especially when, um, you know, when you're young and hyped up and you're ready to go to the gym, you're like, oh, you're just raring to go. It's kind of easy to skip the warm up or cut the warm up short. And that 
you know, you might get away with it, but it's really not the best idea. You, you're much better off, you know, training for that flexibility and stretching and, and just getting everything warm before you really start pounding the weights. Uh, so those are a couple of the key areas that I feel with. Um, and then supplements, you know, there's people who will say, eh, you know, it's it's getting uh, supplement companies richer. You're not, you're not absorbing it. There's there's some supplements that uh, I'm always taking supplements. Now, there there have been some bogus stuff come down the pike, and you can't believe everything you see. Obviously, you know, a lot of the muscle magazines are touting all kinds of stuff that's going to make you Superman, and, you know, it's going to give you all the benefits of steroids without any of the risks, and, you know, it, no, it's not. Dave, that's going to do it. You're a wealth of great information. Thanks so much for your time and for being on the show. Please give us your website again and uh, where people can get your books and how they can get a hold of you before you sign off. Okay, well, um, ChristianIron.com is is the website, and um, I'm on Facebook. I probably do a lot more on Facebook than I do on my website. The website is always there, and my books are all available from the website. Um, And then, of course, they're all on Amazon. Yeah, and half of them are on Kindle. And then the Facebook page is Forgotten Strength Secrets. Well, Bob, I really appreciate uh, your time, and, and thanks for having me on your show. You have a great show. I've you know, listened to uh, some of the podcast stuff and, and, and read on your site all the time. Some of my other friends have written on there. And um, so thanks again, Bob. Ooh, Don't be a flamingo, you have to do your squats. Don't be a flamingo, real lifters work their legs. That's going to do it for this edition of Natural Strength Night on MindForceRadio.com. Please bookmark that website, MindForceRadio.com. Bob is always looking for new writers for naturalstrength.com who are old school, hardcore, write with passion and have a strong anti-steroid stance. He also wants your training questions so they can be answered on the show. Please send your articles and training questions to Bob at mindforceradio at earthlink.net. Thanks for listening. See you next time.